first of all, thank you very much to Alex and other people at SBN for inviting me to be here today. And my great apology to my fellow panelists and to you, that at, uh, at um, 25 to 4, I'm going to slip out very quietly through that door because I'm spending most of the rest of the day before and here and after here with the Metals Industry Association over at Altair Square. And I have to get back to facilitate um, a strategy session with them at that time. Um, but I was still very keen to uh, talk about business journalism. Uh, it is indeed true, as of June the 16th of this year, I have been a business journalist for 40 years. I am so old that when I was studying economics at university, Richard Nixon, I was at university in Chicago, not the University of Chicago, um, took the US off the last vestiges of the gold standard. So that's kind of where I started my business journalism. As fascinating as that's been, I am fundamentally riveted by what happens over the next 20 years. Um, because uh, what is going on in the world is so utterly extraordinary, of which sustainability and all that that simple word entails in its great complexity um, is utterly essential to that. So I'm going to talk about the job that needs to go on with the economy and with business. I'm going to talk briefly about the media, most particularly here in New Zealand, and then about the job the media has to do. Here's kind of the job. This is the infant formula value chain from New Zealand farms to the Chinese market. And the two important um, uh, parts of the graph are the middle one and the right-hand one. The right-hand one is the assets that are employed to have cows, collect the milk, process it, turn it into powders, which then usually get shipped off and made into infant formula somewhere else. We contribute in New Zealand 40% of those assets by value, and yet we only collect 12% of the profits. That's fundamentally unsustainable in a very simple economic sense, but we know what that business model is also doing in terms of what our farming systems are doing to our ecosystem. One of the other things that's going on as we go progress this hell for leather is that our economy is becoming increasingly simple. Um, and so um, we are producing more and more unprocessed or very lightly processed products and increasingly reliant on one market, which is China. The scary thing is that d Chinese consumption of dairy products has not grown for the last 12 months. And we thought it was growing at about 15% a year. To set us in context, um, Harvard and MIT for a long time, time have measured the complexity of economies because the more complex, the richer and more resilient it is. It's color coded um, and uh, we don't do so well on that color coding. The only consolation is that Australia in many respects is simpler than we are. <laughs> um, we also back in um, 2012 ranked in terms of simplicity with Greece, but don't worry uh, we are, in some respects, more sensible than the Greeks, um, and we um, are not slave to a common currency. So it's not all over for us yet. Um, we do know what this landscape looks like. This, for example, is the work of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development in 2050. I'm going to show you now a very busy chart. It's not about the detail. It's about the complexity. This is what has to happen in the world to people's values, human development, economy, agriculture, forests, energy and power, buildings, mobility and materials. And the dark blue stuff is what we have to do by 2020 if we are to stand any chance of doing the more complicated stuff out to 2050. It's a very simple message that this is an utterly unprecedented scale, speed and complexity of change the world hasn't come within CUI of doing before. So business needs to change quite a lot. Um, Peter Baker uh, of the uh, World Business Council talks about a revolution of capitalism. And people like this, John Elkington, one of the great leaders for decades on sustainability, um, talks about breakthrough capitalism with this work by um, his company, Volans. So it's about being ready for the future. And you can see the sort of things that go on there. It's about being ambitious. And of course, that's very much around making sure that everything we do works with the ecosystem, not against it. Because it's only when we start to restore the ecosystem will the ecosystem be more resilient and be able to support us better. So it's not about minimizing a negative footprint. It's about actually getting to a positive footprint. Then, of course, there are all the fair things down here, such as child labor free. 
And then this is the really big one. It's about being incredibly disruptive. Again, this is Volan's work. What are the roadblocks? Well, inadequate technologies is actually not a problem nor is limitations of trade and international agreements, regardless of what you think of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, as you got the line there, you see the biggest issue of all is a lack of political will, followed by vested interests in current approaches. And quite frankly, the vast bulk of business journalism is about reporting what the vested interests are doing in mostly glowing terms, and certainly hardly critical terms. Um, so, as a business journalist, I believe we are fundamentally failing at um, making a, a useful approach through our work um, on um, those roadblocks. In terms of what's going on in New Zealand, the Sustainable Business work net uh, work Network, after a big rethink in recent years, uh, has drastically reshaped what it's doing around these ideas about reshaping profit and about how um, radical that is in terms of renewables, about community, about mega efficiency, but the biggest one of all is about restoration. Again, it's back to that concept uh, that we are trying to rebuild, help nature rebuild ecosystems, and um, so ecosystems can support us. I just thought of this recently. We talk about sustainability, and that sounds as though it, that's something we do to make sure the ecosystem kind of hangs in there. But just a very small change of word to sustaining. So if we talk about sustaining seas, or sustaining rivers, or sustaining soils, that's putting us in our right place of being respectful of those seas that water that soils. So I'm on a new thing here about trying to talk about not sustainability as some kind of human-driven concept, um, but acknowledging the sustaining nature um, of the ecosystem. So, what's the media up to in all this? Um, in common with um, media around the world, there is an utter breakdown in existing media business models. Um, as a result, most media, media organizations are starved of resources and talent, and as a result of that, it's, they are, end up being pretty short of ideas, analysis, and insight, because it's all such a mad scramble with those limited resources. So it's kind of a chicken and egg thing that you start to lose engagement with readers, listeners, viewers. And so then we're starting to see media organizations think that if we just kind of sell people stuff or entertain them, um, that um, that's how we will retain engagement. Uh, and that is increasingly um, a, a mainstream uh, media business model. And even worse, let's kind of co-create stuff with our subjects. It's getting quite hard to find sometimes on the Herald website um, that little print which says that's sponsored content. I, and I began to wonder why so many stories about Mercedes-Benz were turning up in New Zealand um, Herald business headlines, and it's because that content has been co-created um, with um, Mercedes-Benz. I don't think that's journalism. Um, now, there are new media business models out there that can um, do make this work. They can achieve huge scale, they can generate revenues, they can invest in people and content. But it seems to me that by and large so far, that's only working for global brands and big markets, like The Economist, like The Financial Times, like The Wall Street Journal. And the smaller a market is, the harder it is to do, and New Zealand is a minuscule market, so it's exceptionally hard. And certainly NBR is hiring people, it's up to more than 20 staff now. Last I was counting the other day, I got up to 21 plus some columnists. So NBR is having a brave attempt at this, um, but that, um, I would still argue, um, is um, a, a, at best a brave, um, a, a, a brave venture. And you have that sort of competition uh, where this sort of uh, small scale is very tricky. So I was just checking to prepare this, that if you wanted to um, have the Financial Times of, uh, online, um, that is costing you $4.29 a week. Uh, if you want the NBR, it's $5.50. Uh, if you want the Economist, it's $6.50. And, and so the difference in scale as to what NBR can deliver for $5.50 
versus what the Financial Times can deliver at 4.29 or the Economist at 6.50. Of course, there's not, there's hardly any, there's virtually no New Zealand content in there, in those other two. Um, but that, to me, points out this difficulty of um, trying to make a go of this financially. So the media job, though, hasn't changed. It's about reporting and revealing. It's about trying to analyze and give insight. It's about contesting ideas. It's about holding people accountable. And so New Zealand business, journalism, business media, indeed all media, have to have their own breakthrough capitalism. I don't know what that looks like. I keep looking, and if I find it out, I'll invite you to the launch. <laughs> Uh, of inventing uh, radically new business models. But I think there is kind of a co-creation to do, although I don't like that phrase particularly because it's becoming quite pejorative, is that because you're involved in the sustainability area and you are thinking very deeply about these issues about the world, that, um, you can help push the media um, and help them understand, help teach the media how important this is um, because the media are being very slow picking it up themselves. And I think that through that, it will be possible to build greater reader, listener, viewer engagement on these issues, because I think we will be speaking to people about issues that mean a very great deal to them um, in ways that make a lot of sense to them, and whilst being very steely-eyed about how big the issues are, being kind of encouraging about what we could do if we wanted to be truly ambitious around this. Um, so at that point, um, I will stop um, and um, just leave you this thought. I use it a lot. Um, I'm showing my age of the punk rockers. You'll have no future if you don't make one for yourself. Thanks very much. Um, as uh, Rod has to leave, uh, maybe could we just have a couple of quick questions if there's any burning ones for Rod before he goes? Um, I think there's great scope for cooperation. Um, certainly speaking for myself, um, I, it is absolutely invaluable um, the help I get trying to understand issues um, from lots of people in universities. But when it gets to be the sort of thing, I can't remember which university this is in Australia that runs the conversation that used to appear for a while, and it, it's really weak. Um, you know, universities have skills, journalists have skills, you won't find the same skills in one place. So it's a question of being able to cooperate, but I think ob obviously retain our respective independence uh, and contestability of ideas in there, um, but it would be about cooperating rather than trying to co-create anything. Anyone else? Uh, is there a model that's actually working in New Zealand that you can see, or a, s a small example of something that's working? Um, in terms of media, uh, that is. Um, what Vincent Hearing and colleagues have been doing, um, first of all at Unlimited and then Ideologue, and you'll be hearing from Nikki later, um, is a very interesting example of that. Um, but in order to make that work, um, Vincent's wrapped that into Mike Hutchinson's bigger marketing business, and it's retaining you know, good journalistic independence in there. Um, and, and, and so it is working in that sense. But could you scale that into um, a broader or purpose uh, or broad purpose business media? I don't know. And as I say, NBR with NBR radio and, and hiring and all sorts of other stuff um, is also trying to make this work. Um, but um, I, I, I kind of worry about how sustainable it is. And, and I would love to, speaking personally, I'd, I would love to see a whole bunch more in NBR that isn't there but they don't have the time and resource to do. Yes. Uh, Radio New Zealand is the last good newsroom left in the country. It's as simple as that. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I will I'll modify that slightly. Um, the last good general newsroom left in the country. Um, and I say that very, my phraseology there is very direct, it's very clear, um, is there is something incredibly important about the professional discipline that happens in a newsroom, 
um, and whereby there is a very good quality, good judgment, and all the rest. So we see lots of good individual journalists uh, around the media still in New Zealand. But in terms of a general news organization, and I'm saying general there to, um, to separate them out slightly from MBR as a business publication, um, um, it is absolutely, in my mind, the last good newsroom left in the country. I think it's incredibly interesting that very talented TV journalists have ended up there. Now, three of them, uh, last count. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, I think that's very exciting. Um, it uh, would be wonderful um, to see them have more resource.